calm your mind, put your phone down, turn the volume off. Um, could you, our OECD team in the back, could you close the door for us, please? Thanks very much. Um, um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andrea Esterhuisen. I'm from APC, Association for Progressive Communications, um, an international NGO. I'm based in South Africa, personally. And it's really a pleasure to be doing this workshop, I think, particularly because between um, APC, ICC Basis, ISOC, and the government of Brazil, this is, I think, the fourth event, I show, is that correct, on this topic. And I think having successive events on this topic has enabled us to um, come to grips with it in a, in a, in a deeper way. And, and that's what we'll want to do today. I know many of you have been in other workshops on this topic. You've been in the main session on internet governance principles or and the main session on principles for multi-stakeholder cooperation. And what we want to do with this workshop is really uh, deal with very specific experiences to look at the ecosystem of multi-stakeholder participation in internet governance in a more complex way, not just made up of multi-stakeholder processes such as the IGF, um, the proposed meeting in Brazil, um, and other meetings and events and, and that, we, that we participate in, but looking at it more as an ecosystem that also has governmental processes as part of it, business processes and civil society processes. So, so we'll try to, to really delve beyond the surface. Um, I want to start by just quickly introducing um, our panelists. In fact, I'm going to ask them to quickly introduce themselves, starting over there with Wolfgang. Just quickly, who you are and where you're from. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a professor at the University of Aarhus in Denmark, but I'm a German. My name is uh, Johan Hallenborg. I'm Swedish. I work at the Foreign Ministry in the International Law and Human Rights Department. Good morning, my name is Everton Lucero. I'm with the Brazilian Foreign Ministry. Hello, um, you may think that Jeff Brueggemann from AT&T will be here, but he was unable to come. So I am Jackie, or Jacqueline Ruff, from Verizon Communications. Thanks a lot, Jackie. And we have our team, we have our rapporteur, Carlos Afonso, um, over there and who will be taking substantive notes for us. And we have Sarah, who's assisting him. And we have our remote moderator, Constance. Constance, do we have any remote participants so far? Yes, we do, actually. We have one um, remote participant. That's Jimson Onofuye. He's the chair of Af ICTA, the Africa ICT Alliance. OK, so welcome, Jimson. And um, to get us going, you've all got this document, I think, was in front of you. I'd like to ask the, the panel to very briefly and concisely talk about a specific experience of multi-stakeholder cooperation and, and to reflect on, on, on what has worked in that experience and what has not worked in that experience. Taking these, these principles on this page in mind about inclusivity, um, engagement and participation, um, contribution, transparency, and how decisions are made. So they don't have to touch on all of those, but um, a, sp a specific experience. Jackie, are you ready to start? Um, I, I think these principles are uh, very important, very useful, and uh, challenging to accomplish. I would like to share quickly something that we did in the, in the US related to privacy and uh, mobile applications that I, th I think was a, a pretty good example of grappling with some of the challenges here. So the way that it worked is that our government came out with a policy of uh, c consumer uh, rights around privacy. And uh, it, it has not been introduced as legislation, but rather it is there as something that we would aspire to 
in order to implement and operationalize that, there then was a multi-stakeholder process to deal with a particular issue, which is transparency in mobile applications. A very inclusive process of putting together all stakeholders, industry, users, device manufacturers, etc., convened by the government. And the net result of that was to come up with a set of consumer principles that were uh, embraced by the entire group. Now, it took a long time. It was messy. It was a narrow issue. The narrow issue, I think, was helpful in reaching a positive outcome. And the idea was to try to use that process because of rapid technological change, consumer interest, a way to get relatively quickly to an answer. And, and Jackie, just to follow up on that, do you think that that process of developing those consumer principles could have been done in any different way? Is that, is that a process that you think, does that fall into that category of processes that cannot be done other than in a multi-stakeholder way? Or do you think it could have been done in a different way? Well, a more traditional way of doing that would have been just for individual uh, players, industry players doing that, or advocacy by consumer groups, or maybe an industry code. But the idea here was to try to get everybody in. I think it gives it more credibility. The, the question is, as I said, it was a narrow issue. How can you succeed with a more complex issue? Um, and uh, how do you reach decision making? It really was a, in the end, a consensus decision making process. But I think some of the, the challenges in the principles that we're looking at today are around uh, getting the relevant stakeholders there and uh, doing the decision making in an inclusive way. Thanks very much. Everton. Thank you, Mariette. Uh, I have two examples. And one open question, perhaps for, you, for us to discuss further during the debates. Uh, one example is already well known by everyone, I think, is the Brazilian experience in a multi-stakeholder process that managed to develop uh, a set of ten principles that are a reference in Brazil uh, for any uh, stakeholder group, precisely because it was developed in a multi-stakeholder environment, which is cgi.br but I will not uh, extend myself on that uh, to develop if there is any question about that it's just to refer as an example that could have been perhaps much more difficult to develop than to achieve had we not had in Brazil one as a body a uh, representative body uh, that is balanced in terms of representation from uh, industry civil society and uh, uh, ac academy and government as well and technology so this is uh, example number one. Example number two is, uh, has actually been presented in the previous workshop earlier today, uh, which is related to how to uh, combat spam by managing port 25. Uh, it looks like it's a very technical matter, but in fact, it, uh, experience showed us that it has been possible only because we had a multi-stakeholder body in place in Brazil that uh, was able to bring together around the same table all relevant actors, including uh, telecom companies, the regulator, the uh, ISPs, the content providers, and uh, so everyone together with the government and the civil society uh, were able to get to uh, an agreement on how to tackle this issue. And the result is impressive, it has been presented already, I will not repeat here, but it just to summarize, it brought down Brazil to list results on the top of the list of uh, countries uh, of uh, origin, originating spam and uh, uh, it, the, the result is impressive because now so it's well down this, this list. It's just because there was this possibility of coming together from the different sectors and working together towards that end that really uh, uh, allowed for the, uh, a concrete result to be achieved. And the open question that I will leave for uh, our discussion is uh, uh, in light of the recent events of unauthorized surveillance of data from uh, Brazilian citizens, including Brazilian authorities, companies, and uh, ministries. Uh, first question that we asked was 
what is the adequate uh, environment that we should take up this matter at the international level, because this is a matter that is not only related to uh, Brazil, it couldn't be dealt with within our own multi stakeholder environment. And the answer is, well, of course, you have the IGF, but the IGF will not produce any kind of uh, concrete uh, result or conclusion about this issue. So uh, you are, might be very well aware that our president uh, made a special reference to this issue when she opened the general debate at the United Nations General Assembly this uh, September, and uh, we are actually in Brazil uh, considering options on how to deal that in a most inclusive and multi-stakeholder way. That's why you are aware we brought this as a contribution to the IGF. Our Minister of Communications spoke about that at the opening session, and we are still looking for ways. And the question is where to consider that, because we do not have today, and this is, a, I think, a relevant question, we do not have a reference framework or platform that would tackle this kind of issue and present solutions or present a way forward that is reasonable and adequate to the needs that we have as, uh, as victims of what happened. Uh, we believe that we need to uh, consider that as the evolution of the multi-stakeholder model in order to provide channels to address this kind of situation whenever it arises. Uh, we don't have uh, definite answers for how to conduct this, but that's why we brought here as a proposal actually an, uh, a white sheet of paper to be filled in with contributions from different stakeholders, hopefully to be uh, to be uh, producing an input for the conference that we are uh, looking forward to host in Brazil in the first semester of 2014, uh, precisely to uh, take into account the different questions that are related to this issue. Of course, we are not talking about a conference on surveillance, we are talking about a conference on internet governance and how to rebuild trust and uh, take forward take the next step, the evolution of the internet governance model that we have in ways that is really effective to the needs that we all share. Thank you. Thanks, Everton. Your hand. Thank you very much. Um, I will give uh, two examples, I think. Uh, one is from the regional level. Um, actually, we are involved in, in, we are members of the Council of Europe, a 47 uh, state member uh, uh, body uh, located in Strasbourg. Uh, which is really a, a human rights organization. Um, as you know, the European Court on Human Rights is located in Strasbourg, the building of the European Convention. But the, the Council also adopts um, various recommendations and, and other kinds of soft law texts. And I'm involved in a work now on developing a, a guide on human rights for Internet users, which is an initiative in the framework of the Council of Europe's Internet uh, Governance Strategy. Um, and I think this, this is an interesting example uh, of, of a multi-stakeholder process. Um, uh, the, the work originates from, from uh, development of, of a draft in an expert committee where uh, only a few governments actually are, are present, but equal amount of individual experts representing uh, their own personal capacity but come from a variety of backgrounds, journalists, academics, etc. So the draft is then consulted, and even prior to the first draft, there was a questionnaire sent out in the various networks that we all have access to, uh, trying to find uh, what are the main problems that you encounter as an internet user. Uh, so we're trying to, to from, from that consultation, widely, to find what are the most pressing issues. So from that, uh, it was, was more uh, it was more easy to, to build the first draft uh, in the expert in the expert committee. The expert committee is also open to uh, participation from other other uh, stakeholders. We have had uh, industry there. We have had both uh, IT companies and ISPs there. We have had other governments, and we've had also other international governmental organizations, such as the such as the EU, for example. After further work um, and, and refinement. Um, 
the draft moves into the more political part of the council, um, where it is uh, where it is at present. Uh, but even so, the consultation will continue. The consultation continue, continues widely on this final draft, and tomorrow there will be an open forum here at the IGF on this draft, uh, which gives us another opportunity to get input from from a wide array of, of, of actors. So finally, the um, the recommendation. Um, as a soft law instrument will be adopted by ministers of the 47 countries and uh, of course they are they are free of course uh, to do whatever they like with the draft uh, and uh, there is always a risk that the, the final product will will be slightly amended however um, I still consider this to be a quite a good example because we have transparency at least about how the process works and we have been able to to solicit input all the way up to to the final moment so to me, I think this is a fairly, this is the first time I was involved in this, and I think it's a fairly interesting and good example of how an international organization could work with, with a multi-stakeholder process. The second example is from, from Sweden, uh, and it's not really about uh, making decisions in a, in a multi-stakeholder environment, but I'd just like to highlight it anyway. We have, since many years in Sweden, a reference group on internet governance. Uh, and this is a, a completely open group for, for any stakeholder who are interested in issues relating to internet governance. Um, so there are people from a variety of different ministries, but also from state agencies, from the academia, from, uh, from civil society and from companies present. And we meet every two months and there is a, it's a long agenda of issues that we discuss. Uh, we solicit input if, um, if there is a possibility to do that. We don't make any formal decisions, but it's a very effective way of sharing information and getting input from, from other people uh, with, with other backgrounds and interests. Um, there is an, a quite effective email list as well that runs uh, through this network. So this is our way of, of working at, at uh, the national level with these issues not to create any binding decisions, but to solicit input and to share information. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Johan. Before I, I ask Wolfgang to comment, it, I think these examples that we've heard, they are really, they, I would say, they fall into three broad categories. The one is broad networking, um, national forum, CGI, .br, and the Sweden um, Internet Steering Group, which are ongoing processes where different stakeholders come together to talk about the internet. And, and I assume you would be able to deal with issues as they arise. Some are probably routine, some are, some are less routine. But it, it's, it's a process that builds trust and, and, and builds relationships and understanding. Um, and then we have the example of um, two very specific issues. I think there's the consumer, the consumer law. We also had an example of dealing with spam the port 25 and this workshop is about de-jargonizing by the way so maybe Everton you need to explain to people who don't go and change their port numbers and their settings what port 25 is when you have the mic again um, and also I think the Council of Europe even though human rights is a very broad issue that is where you were working together to come up with a very specific output and then we have a, um, a crisis scenario where, where the, the issue of, of the, the mass surveillance revelations uh, a, a moment of breakdown in trust, um, not just in the network and in the safety of our communications, but also in one another, um, as states, as consumers, to platforms, to businesses. Um, so, so I think, and then we're looking at a multi-stakeholder response to that. I think my question to, to to Wolfgang is, you know, for you to just reflect on that based on all your experience on this. Um, how do you see, I, mean, I think we also here still talking about um, hard law and soft law, but most of these were soft law processes, I'm right, I'm talking the consumer principles are soft law, spam was soft law, human rights guidelines for users, Council of Europe is soft law, and surveillance, I'm not sure what it will turn out to be, and I think maybe that's one of the things that we should, we should um, talk about. But Wolfgang, do you think that we are at a stage now where we have good experience and confidence in multi-stakeholder processes for soft law, but not yet for hard law. Is, is that perhaps one of the issues we need to think about?
Oh, um, yesterday morning we had uh, another workshop about internet governance principles. It's important to make this differentiation between internet governance principles and multi-stakeholder principles. Because multi-stakeholder principles is more about procedures for the interaction among the various stakeholders, while the other thing is more on substance or content oriented. And uh, your question on hard law is, uh, do we need, let's say, treaties for the substance or also rules of procedure for the interaction? Um, yesterday morning when we had eight different projects for internet governance principles, four from governmental organizations like OECD, Council of Europe, and the um, um, IPSA countries and the Shanghai group, and for non-governmental things. More or less we agreed that to move towards a hard law document makes no sense. The, 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 the comparison which came in the discussion was the situation after World War II when after the massive violation of human rights, um, governments realized they have to do something. Eleanor Roosevelt chaired the third committee in the General Assembly of the United Nations and some governments wanted to have a treaty and Eleanor Roosevelt said, you know, wait a minute, treaty negotiations, hard law, needs 20 years. So let's agree on very general principles. And probably we can agree on things like no torture, freedom of expression, right to education, or things like that. But the outcome was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights within two years as a non-legally binding document, a soft law instrument. But the soft law instrument, of, like the Human Rights Declaration, had an immense political meaning. And even we see it still today, massive violation of human rights. You have a reference document where you can say, you know, with naming and shaming, you can do something. So, so far for the substance. But this is on multi-stakeholder principles, the interaction among the various um, uh, stakeholders. Um, you know, the rules of procedure for interaction among stakeholders are done just by doing it, by making it. So they will develop the principles, grow bottom up. I remember the very last day in the working group on internet governance when we finished in Geneva, the final report, we defined the roles of the stakeholders. And then somebody said, Nitin, Desai was the chairman, should we have another paragraph for the interaction among the, the, the stakeholders? And he said, oh, this will take time next time. So that means there is no paragraph in the Wikic report which defines the interaction among the stakeholders. And after seven years, and I think this is really achievement, and we should recognize this as an achievement, by doing it, by practicing multi-stakeholder cooperation, we have a number of principles. And it was really fantastic, the example which was used by Everton for the, the, the Brazilian case and spam. As long as the stakeholders are sitting in their silos, then every individual stakeholder will make mistakes because he ignores some elements which are needed to be uh, in, introduced or, or, or taken into consideration to find a final solution. In Europe, we had some governments who pushed the parliament to adopt the law against spam. You know, this is already forgotten laws, but you know, this didn't help. So that means you have to have this, this multi-stakeholder coming together out of the silos from the various stakeholders and in the process you produce the principles because then you understand how it works. I think um, ICANN is another very good example and Chuck Gomes, the former chair of the GNSO Council is here. In the GNSO Council we have so many various constituencies and it's so difficult to reach agreement but you know in the process, you know, we're developing procedures for interaction and, you know, how then to communicate with the board, how the GAC uh, advice comes into these processes. So these procedures, the interaction among the stakeholders are done in the process. We are not yet at the moment where we can define it. And I would not recommend to define this in a hard law document. So these are really flexible things. They are developed on a case-by-case -case basis. There will be no silver bullet that you say, here you have a procedure and if you followed it, you will reach your aim. But it means each new situation will create new needs. You know, cloud computing creates new needs. You know, how to manage this. 
with the sovereignty of nation states, you know, how to accommodate all these various things. You know, the new cases of surveillance, you know, is there a need for a multi-stakeholder discussion about, you know, how to bring surveillance and espionage under the rule of law? I think, you know, if you have fixed, stable legal procedures, you know, this will block uh, you to move forward. But if you have flexible mechanisms, then you can build around the special needs of the special issues, flexible procedures. So, and this would be my recommendation, not to think in categories of hard law, but you know, to keep the flexibility by working with soft law. And the Human Rights Declaration is a very good example that soft law works. Thank you. Um, thanks, Wolfgang. And I think you make a really important point, um, which is one of the challenges of multi-stakeholder processes they tend to be inclusive and legitimate among those who participate in them. It's very difficult to, 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 uh, to consolidate their legitimacy at a structural level you know, by saying this is how it works, step one, two, and three. They create their own legitimacy, and I think that's challenging in a, in a governance um, environment. But I want to open it um, to the floor and, and, and actually and remind you of the, the two questions that our panelists have raised. Um, there was Jackie's question about how do we use these processes when we're dealing with more complex issues, not necessarily very narrow or, or specific uh, issues. And Everton's question about how do we use these processes when dealing with a super complex and super contentious issue, an issue that has so many layers of relationships um, at stake, such as um, surveillance. Is it possible, how do we go about it? So open to all of you. Introduce yourself and try and be brief. Lorenzo Pillow from Telecom Italia. Um, to give some suggestion uh, to answer this question, um, I think that we, one issue that we should uh, address here is uh, understand better uh, the process of uh, uh, if the multi-stakeholder approach implies shared responsibility, but this does not mean to have uh, equal responsibility. In other words, one of the most challenging issues today is uh, uh, this idea of, of how the multi-stakeholder approach can uh, respond to the change in the characterizing now internet. And, uh, for instance, one of the most important issues today is this more active role compared to the past that the government want to play. Um, so I think that it's extremely important to try to understand if uh, to approach the more complex issues, probably we should allow for more uh, flexibility. In other words, given that uh, all the players will be included, but then uh, on some specific issues, Maybe some players should take the lead. In other words, to make very clear this distinction between shared responsibilities and uh, equal responsibilities. Oh, by the way, on these issues, we will organize later on today a workshop with uh, also the OECD will be present, Professor Christopher Yu from the University of Pennsylvania, the European Commission, on this specific issue. Two thirds. That's a very good point. Gentlemen over there. Uh, Chuck Gomes from Verisign, uh, uh, and like Wolfgang said, I, I've been in the GNGNSO a long time, uh, so, and I wish I could say that we have solved all the complex issues that Jackie and Everton raised. Uh, I think we do have one example at least that would probably even fit Everton's category of super complex. Uh, all I have to do is uh, spell it out, uh, W-H-O-I-S, who is? <laughs> it's a classic. And I also wish I could say that we have, we've, we've learned how to handle those. It's tough. I think the first thing in answer to your questions that I would say is that uh, it takes a lot of time and it's messy. Uh, and, and what that results in then is that people want to find another way and the other way is typically not multi-stakeholder. Much faster though. And so one of the challenges going forward in, in the IGF world as well as in the ICANN world for me is how can we speed it up? How can we maybe reach resolutions that are mutually satisfactory, at least to a degree, uh, 
without such inordinate amounts of time? I don't know the answer to that. We're continuing to strive. Um, I look at the, the list of principles, and they're great principles. Um, but there's there's one there's one uh, compound word there that probably is the most difficult, and that's decision making. It's challenging to get the input from everybody, uh, but we can do that, and, and, and we haven't necessarily achieved all of it, like, for example, getting things in multiple languages and things like that, but there are things that we can do and figure out to do to get the input and to keep it open and to reach out to stakeholders, et cetera. The real tough part is the decision making, and that, again, is a place where often there's a compromise in the multi-stakeholder model in order to get it done. Can we have a microphone to that gentleman? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Erno Storm. I'm from the Norwegian Post and Telecom Authority. I participate also in, in the GAP for Norway. Um, Thank you for this uh, a really good setup of, of this workshop and a, a very interesting and important issue. Um, my comments on, we also have a very good examples of multisimple participation, developing best practices on staff, for example, in Norway, and, and, and also one on principles on network neutrality that works as a software example. So I think my input to, to the questions is that the complex issues, I think it's quite important to try to isolate the issues. Uh, because in our case, our experience where we have succeeded in soft, soft law and multi-stakeholder cooperation is when we have specific issues identified. And also, it is important to isolate the issues because then also you can um, um, identify the relevant stakeholders because if the problem is too complex it's also difficult to gather all the relevant stakeholders and to get a proper sort of input from those stakeholders so that's also one important aspect in using those principles thank you um, i agree with you but also just to be devil's advocate on that i think it absolutely makes sense. But if you take something like cybercrime, for example, I've heard quite a lot of criticism of the, the, the government-led cybercrime conferences. Now, one would think, because those, and I think governments have tried to identify specific relevant stakeholders to participate in those. But there are many other stakeholders who are not necessarily specifically involved with, with, with cybercrime issues, but they're broadly involved with human rights issues. So. So I agree with you, but I think there can also be um, complexity. But definitely identify stakeholders specifically is something we don't talk about enough. Okay, we have Renalia and then Makan, and then I'm going to give it back to the panel. Thank you, Andrea. Renalia Abdurrahim right from Malaysia. Uh, I can't add much about your committee. I actually agree with a comment from the gentleman just now, um, and I would like to link it to the Brazilian experience. I think that the success of the Brazilian experience in dealing with the spam issue is because they already have an established entity with convening power. They are within a national um, jurisdiction. You know a lot of the role players already, and you are able to bring the players together. And if the forum of discussion is also open, and there is um, awareness raising already that the discussion was going to happen, then the other uh, stakeholders who have not been identified and who may self-identify with this issue could participate in the process. And also I'd like to respond to the point that Chuck Gomes made about dealing with complexity, um, about people wanting to speed it up and probably wanting a less multi-stakeholder decision-making process. In terms of speeding it up, what I've observed from, from multi-stakeholder processes, and it's also something that Bertrand de La Chapelle used to say quite a lot, is that Different stakeholders come from, with their own frames of understanding about a particular problem. So the first challenge is to come up with a common understanding of what the issue is. And if there is 
developed already some kind of analysis of the range of understanding and trying to understand what the commonalities are and what the differences are, that could speed up um, the process of getting to deal with the differences. And that would also help in terms of uh, trying to achieve a faster decision. That's not to say that it will not be um, less contentious. Stakeholders' participation is not uh, always uh, seen or not always welcome. So, uh, what we have suggested during the African IGF is to make sure that uh, the process is formalized through making sure that uh, government or parliament passes an act where uh, it is mandatory for other stakeholders to participate in the policy process. And this has been done in several countries, like in uh, Kenya, South Africa, and Mali, where uh, in any political process, they will bring all the other stakeholders to be part of, uh, part of it. So I think this is uh, an element which also can serve as an example uh, for uh, other processes and for other countries. Uh, by the way, we are inviting you to a workshop on deepening stakeholder activity this afternoon from 4.30 to 6, led by the African group in uh, Room 7 in Tamani. Thank you. Thank you, Makan. I think that's a very important point. And, and that's about just making public consultation and policy processes um, obligatory, which I think many of you probably take for granted, but there are still many countries where government departments and where parliament doesn't actually have a public consultation process on legislation, and that's what we're trying to achieve in Africa. So I think one also needs to look at multi-stakeholder processes in a broader context of what the political and decision-making culture is in the country. Okay, panel, for you to respond, I think the things that stood out for me was um, shared responsibility. Um, is shared respons responsibility necessarily equal responsibility? Do different stakeholders play different roles in different phases um, of a multi-stakeholder problem solving or policy development process? There's the question from Chuck on um, speed, <laughs> getting things done. And, and being more efficient, particularly because if these multi-stakeholder processes do not deliver, there's a tendency for other stakeholders, business usually or government, to just you know go and fill the gap. Um, and then there's the question um, from Norway or the point about specificity, not just of issues, but of making sure you've got the relevant stakeholders as part of the process and, and how do we do that. And then the point about differences. Um, and, and beginning to speed up a process by consolidating where the commonalities are and where the differences are at the outset. So, um, yes, who wants to go first? I'll, I'll start again. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, yeah, first of all, it's important to step back and remember that we're talking about internet-related issues because to me that drives a couple of the conclusions here, and one is that soft law is most likely to be the right answer. Uh, I thought that Wolfgang's uh, point about soft law versus hard law at the beginning was instructive for a number of reasons, one of which is for what we're talking about, we really are most often looking, I think, for agreement on on things that are going to be changing over time, that are very consumer, user oriented, et cetera. So they're looking for application. They really lend themselves to that. Um, and I think on the speed question, yes, we should be trying to speed things up, and that does then help convince others that this is the right way to do things, the right mechanism to use. On the other hand, there is the point of comparison because, again, Wolfgang said, you know, two years to get to a declaration, 20 years to get to a treaty, 
and some of the other issues that we've been looking at, maybe the spam issue, if you had some very technical kind of uh, standard or something that you developed, that could take many years, and you did it quite quickly. Um, but all of these things, I believe, I'm, I'm an optimist, and that the more that we do them, the more that we develop the practice of approaching these kinds of things in a truly multi-stakeholder way, including on the decision making, then it'll get easier over time and we'll be able to, I know we've got some things to deal with short term that are complex, but uh, longer term we will also develop more practice, experience, and, and willingness to use these sorts of mechanisms. I will defer the question on explaining 425 to anybody in the audience that has a better technical background. <laughs> That's not my case, definitely. And I'd welcome anyone just to step up and explain that. My comment was on, on regarding the questions that were posed. First, on the question of shared responsibility versus equal responsibility, I think that this debate is already reflected in the result of this agenda when uh, it says that each stakeholder uh, on uh, their respective roles according to their respective roles and responsibilities. For instance, when it comes to public policy, clearly there is the need for the government to step up and uh, do their job because it's their responsibility. They are responsible for public policy. Uh, so that's one point. And it goes also, uh, it relates also to the question of uh, Macan, our colleague Macan, when he said that in some African countries, for instance, and that's a very good example, thank you for bringing this up, because in some African countries uh, in which the tradition is to have a very government-centered decision-making process without even listening to civil society, uh, what is the way forward is precisely enacting laws to mandate participation, and that is great. You might see that as a top-down approach, but it's a top-down decision that requires a law to allow for a bottom-up participation. So there is an interaction of the two layers that uh, actually uh, help evolving a model towards more participation and multi-stakeholder processes. So it's a great example. Uh, on, the, on isolating the issues, I totally agree from Norway, I think it's uh, definitely a need to focus, to establish some uh, borderlines or focusing on what is the question that we need to address. Otherwise, each stakeholder and each different perspective will bring, bring in uh, a different agenda and then it will be really impossible to uh, reproduce the same debate over and over. I agree with uh, Wolfgang when he said that uh, Yes, uh, there are no. Uh, we will develop the road uh, the w along the way that we are walking it. I mean, we build the road when we walk it. But that this is a good image, provided that we have a north, provided that there are uh, certain principles and uh, goals that we all share. Otherwise, we might end up just by going in circles, and that's that's a real danger in case we do not have a common understanding prior to that. And uh, lastly, I'd like to say that uh, the decision we had at the highest level within the Brazilian government to bring to this forum and to bring to the United Nations the sensitive issue that I mentioned of uh, unauthorized surveillance of communications is a, actually a concrete example of our genuine belief in multi-stakeholderism. We could have, as Chuck said, uh, chosen an easier path of a top-down approach and going to other fora that might all uh, be limited to government participation, but we took the decision at the highest level to bring this to an open, to open this to all stakeholders for us to build a solution together because we believe it affects all of us, not only the Brazilian government, it affects all of us. So this is a proof that Brazil is fully committed to multi-stakeholderism. 
and I say that very loudly because I want you to understand once and for all that uh, there are no reasons to doubt our commitment to multi-stakeholderism when we come up with an idea of hosting a meeting uh, next year about this issue. We want it to be multi-stakeholder. Our president has even tweeted that she defends multi-stakeholderism and there's no point in continue questioning that. So this is uh, for us a point that is actually really important to, uh, for you all to understand. And we believe this is a basis because if we are rebuilding trust in internet governance processes, we need to do it, do it starting from trusting ourselves who are uh, in, in the vision. Thank you. Um, before I give to Johan, I just, just want to point out quickly, I think there's a bit of a contradiction between what I think the speaker from Norway said and what the Tunis agenda says, because I think partly the, the, the identification of stakeholders to participate on very specific issues is a very specific process, and different stakeholders would have different roles on different issues. So I think what we find that's restrictive uh, in the Tunis agenda text that doesn't reflect the evolution of the internet or internet governance is that it implies that civil society all only has one role, government has one role, technical community has one role, business has one role. So just to flag that, because I think we probably, none of us agree that those roles are rigidly fixed, but I think we need to recognize that different issues often require those stakeholder groups to play a slightly different role in the process. Anyway, to, to give to Johan and then Wolfgang, and then we have quite a few people on the floor that want to participate and we um, are more than halfway, so let's be brief. Thank you very much. Um, just a brief comment on, on the importance of principles and so forth. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to hear the reference to, to the work of, of the, the International Bill of Rights, which, is, uh, which consists of the Declaration and the two, two covenants in which then were adopted in the 1960s. But the Universal Declaration, although it was what it is, a declaration, um, considered by, by everyone, I would say, that most parts of that is not soft law anymore, it's become hard law, because of its status as customary international law, which, which then is binding. So don't underestimate the power of soft law. It may take time, uh, but um, over, over time it will develop into real binding law, which is good, of course. Um, on, on the government policy making and uh, different national um, sort of characteristics on, on consultation and, and multi-stakeholderism. I'd like to mention that in, in, in my country there is a, many, many decades an established consultation procedure for every piece of legislation that we adopt. And in that, um, in that process, civil society, industry, academia, everyone is, is welcome to contribute. Uh, and this is a, since, since it's, it's part of, of the political culture in my country, uh, which is that sometimes people uh, accuse us of being consensus driven and being slow. But uh, it is it's developed into something which is very, um, very natural to, for us to do. It opens up the government because um, it gives access to every piece of new legislation and in, in that way it creates uh, legitimacy for government action and it also improves transparency which is, which is important. So I just wanted to mention that on a general level, not related to just internet uh, issues. Uh, the final point is that I, um, I think we have in, in some, in some Forum, there are particular challenges in realizing a multi stakeholder process, of course. And I totally understand what, what Everton is saying, uh, and I respect that bringing the issue to the UN uh, is, is, is very good, and uh, we are strong believers in the UN. But I also um, think that realizing a multi stakeholder process in the UN context could really be a challenge sometimes. Uh, so, um, looking at the work in the CSD, for example, looking at, at, at other consultative processes in the UN, it's not that easy to make effective multi stakeholder uh, which doesn't doesn't say that we shouldn't try, but I'm just saying it, it could be a could be a challenge. Thank you.
Wolfgang, do you have something? We have got quite a, we've got a remote participant, so we'll have him afterwards, Constance, and then I'll go to the floor. Okay, yes, you know, decision making in a multi stakeholder environment is uncharted territory. We have to face this, we have to invent something which is new because we know decision making procedures in one stakeholder organizations, government, private sector, others, but to do it together, to share it, that's really a big problem. Um, you know, in the definition of internet governance, uh, the first part speaks about the participation of all stakeholders in their respective roles. And the second part speaks about shared principles, programs, and decision-making procedures. I ask you the question in the first plenary, what the government think about uh, whether governments are ready to share decision-making with civil society and the private sector, but neither Ed Vesey, for Minister from the UK, nor uh, Mr. Sepulveda from the US Department of State gave an answer to this question. I think uh, this is really, we don't know, you know, how to share this, but the internet is about sharing. And this is a challenge. We have to move forward. So that means we have to invent something which goes beyond the existing structures. If you go back to history, this is not so totally new. You know, after the Industrial Revolution, you know, one of the effects from the Industrial Revolution was also a challenge for the existing governance system. Decision making was made mainly by the king. He consulted with ministers and then he made a decision, you know, to do this or that or to go to war or something like that. But then, you know, people said, okay, wait a minute, we need a parliament. So a parliament was invented. It was a much more complex decision-making procedure within the parliament. It was a power struggle between the palace and the parliament, you know. And the question was then how to share, you know, decision-making capacity between the king and its ministers and the parliament. And it took over 100 years or longer you know, how this was worked out. So that means when we are talking now about sharing decision-making procedures, this is also sharing about power. So we should, uh, decision-making power, we should not uh, ignore this, so that we should face this. And the consequence is, this is much more complex than the traditional system. A one stakeholder procedure is much, is, is, you could say it's simple, it's complex enough, you know, within a government. But it's simple compared with the multi-stakeholder processes. And, you know, if somebody gives you a simple answer to a complex situation, he's a liar. But it means we have to face that we need complex mechanisms to reflect this rather complex reality. So, and it will take some time that we, we should not lament that, you know, we, it, it, it's time consuming and things like that. We need time to do this. We should not be in a hurry. We should work very hard that we achieve something, but we should be aware we enter uncharted territory and we have to invent something. So the existing experiences are good, but not good enough to meet all the new challenges. Thanks, Mr. We'll come to, to, to Jimson, but first I'd like to give the floor to Benedito from Brazil, and then we had a gentleman over there. Just and we have Rinali again, and we are just a solo Thank you. Actually, I have not asked for the floor. But please, you give me the floor. I have a comment. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, just briefly referring to the point that was made that uh, it's hard to reconcile a uh, UN approach, which was led by the President to each nation needs to develop uh, what was called the international civil framework to, to reconcile this UN approach with the whole stakeholder approach, which is exemplified and illustrated by our willingness and our intent to come to this meeting and ask for support and assistance to define uh, how we can go about it. But uh, even when our president was at the UN, uh, there was a very clear realization that. Uh, anything related to the internet cannot be done in a purely intergovernmental setting, uh, especially if we are talking about principles, about norms. So the president, at that time, she had already been interesting. So it is uh, completely consistent that we are doing this since we uh, consider uh, that if we work in a purely intergovernmental setting, uh, the kind of authoritative document authoritative uh, normative documents along the lines possibly of, of what uh, 
Act uh, was mentioned in the uh, form of soft law, but to convey an authority that would indeed uh, represent something new in what we have today. Uh, yeah, there have been we need to, to work in a good stakeholder environment. Uh, and uh, we are, I think this is the, the, the way we see things moving on uh, in preparation for our meeting. And uh, we are very glad about this, the discussions we are having in the context of this IGF. Uh, I think the work IGF has been doing in regard to principles, the discussion that has been taking place here and for this particular IGF. Uh, I think it's a very happy coincidence that oh, we have so many important discussion on this issue. And this was decided even before the disclosures uh, we have, but it, uh, it, it provides a very good uh, setting for further refining ideas. And uh, I want to ensure the willingness on the part of uh, the government to fully take into account what is being said, what is being discussed, things that everyone was saying. We are convinced that the good stakeholder environment is uh, something that must undoubtedly be uh, the, the setting for the development of, of the follow up to, to what is present in the state of the UN. We are looking forward to what we call stakeholders. Thank you very much. Before I give to the next person, can I just have a quick show of hands? And um, how many people in the room are from government or the public sector? Business? Civil society? It's fairly, fairly, fairly balanced. <laughs> so, <laughs> now I'm just technical. Oh, I'm so sorry. That is the biggest faux pas one can make at the IGF. Sorry, technical. <laughs> um, not that many technical. That's, that's interesting. There are some, though. Now, I was just thinking about that because of, of the comments about walking the talk and, and building this process uh, in practice. So I was checking whether we all walking together or not. Over to you. I'm John Curran, President and CEO of Aaron. <coughs> I'm one of the few technical ones in the room, I guess. So. But I, I speak loudly, so hopefully that will make up in, in, uh, in uh, the numbers. Um, I don't know where this formulation of multi-stakeholder principles are, but it's remarkably good. It's very clear and succinct. I found myself recently working on a very similar list of principles, and I, I very nearly, upon seeing this, threw them out and just said, I'm going to use this, and uh, I'm successful, I'm done, because I can just adopt it. Um, I didn't do that. I actually did look very carefully, and I have four points I'd like to uh, raise and it's not there are no right answers or wrong here answers these are issues for consideration um, relevant stakeholders versus relevant inputs um, the principles here have relevant stakeholders and uh, I have uh, something that talks about relevant inputs being weighed in the decisional process and interested parties or interested folks participating because in some forms it's very hard to tell someone they're not a relevant stakeholder if you actually want to be open you actually have to let all the inputs come and weigh them based on their relevance so it's worth thinking about whether uh, if we converge on multi-stakeholder principles whether we're talking about relevant stakeholders versus uh, interested stakeholders and that's also an open versus representational multi-stakeholder question, obviously. Um, it also brings in uh, a specific question of public comment and remote participation where available, which is not mentioned, but uh, in the technical community, we probably couldn't get away without a statement that said everyone can comment uh, regardless of if you're a dog, you can still comment. It's fine. Um, and, and so... Uh, Two other uh, points. Um, transparency is reflected for process and decision making, but it's not very clear whether it's reflected for the inputs. And um, that could be important for people. The fact that a, a decision's made and we've documented the inputs for the decision 
doesn't mean that people know their other inputs have been recorded and it's worth thinking about. The last last point is, and it may not belong in here, it may belong as a commitment of an organization using these principles, but there's no mention, we have a discussion of all these wonderful processes and what they have to conform to, but there's no mention of due process for appeal when those processes aren't followed. Now it may be that may not be provided for as part of the framework of multi-stakeholder principles. That may be something some organizations do and some don't. Um, but I found when I wrote them out, I inevitably had to put something in uh, that considered the fact that all these principles also have to be followed and there has to be a provision for due process if they're not. Uh, I think this is wonderful and thank you for the panelists and the organizers for the workshop. Thanks very much. So we have Jimson and then Renalia. Thank you. We actually have two interventions from two remote participants. The first one is Igor Ostrowski. He's the founder of Centrum Cifroje, a digital think tank based in Warsaw, Poland, and he's also a member of the MAG. All panelists assume that stakeholders have equal interest in participating in the dialogue. Do the panelists believe the stakeholder model can work when one of the most important participants, namely the government, withdraws from the process. This was the case in Poland where the multi-stakeholder approach was a great approach until ACTA when the Polish government limited areas of cooperation, leaving other stakeholders in limbo. And the second question comes from Jimson, may I add? Jimson says, I greet the moderator, the panelists, and all present. Good morning. I really appreciate the comments made so far, and that of Wolfgang in particular. Let me cite the case of Nigeria. Developing and effectively using multi-stakeholder principles in Nigeria was at first a huge challenge until the government stepped in to aid the formation of a multi-stakeholder organization for the management of the .ng CCTLD. That singular intervention and with a dynamic leadership of the .ng organization we call Nigeria Internet Registration Association, the convening of open, transparent and inclusive, inc inclusive forum began in 2012 and this year's edition is a superlative success. First, can we therefore generalize that we need some government muscle to get the multi-stakeholder model going just as it helped in the first place? And second, is there a possibility that multi-stakeholder model can evolve into a decision-making multi-stakeholder council with binding consensus-based decisions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rinalia. Thank you, Henriette. I'll comment on one of the interventions just now about the role of government in catalyzing a multi-stakeholder um, entity or process or initiative. In my experience, I think that governments can do it, but it's contextual in some countries. It, it may work in others, it may not depend on the influence of the actor and their, their experience in the subject matter. Um, now on to my other comments. Yes. I would like to touch on the principle of inclusion, um, because I think this is a great challenge, and tie it with the problem of speed in coming to a decision. Um, in, in trying to come to decision making, you have three stages. You have agenda setting, then you have options generation, and then you have decision making. In the agenda setting part, that is the broadest level where you can bring in stakeholder participation. And it is, unfortunately, you, you do require to have an iterative process because you cannot expect to just have one event or one forum and you can get the broadest participation and all the input. There is actually a build up to that. If the speed of all the stages go too, goes too fast, you risk um, including some people, especially if the issue is complex and they don't realize the impact of that issue for themselves or their stakeholder group. So there is sort of like some patience that's needed in the process itself. And just wanted to say that it's important to be clear in, in the minds of people handling multi stakeholder processes of these stages because you. you it gives you a better perspective on who needs to be at the table. And scholars who study policy development 
actually came to the conclusion that participation of stakeholders is widest at agenda setting. It narrows a little bit in policy formulation or options generation because that requires knowledge and specialized skills. And then decision making, it is actually the narrowest because that you, you have delegated the authority for decision making to a specific group. May, may they be multi-stakeholder or not. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, yes, go for it. And then we need to start uh, doing our closing phase of the event. Microphone. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ronnie Storm here. Uh, just a quick comment on, on identifying relevant stakeholders. And, uh, I think the example of the CGI in Brazil is a, is a good example. They have done a, quite a lot of groundwork to actually do that and identify the relevant stakeholders. And I think that might be a process that we're going to explore for other countries as well, I think, too, because then they will be able to sort of take into everyone's consideration. Uh, so, so, so I think that's a good example of that uh, countries can use. And just an also comment uh, to which was made uh, from Aaron as well, and in, in, in your comments, in the, of course, in the traditional lawmaking, we have public consultations and all inputs are allowed, but of course not all inputs are relevant. So that was a very good description we gave on sort of the different steps and then at the end in the analysis of the inputs then of course you wait and evaluate if the inputs are relevant or not and then of course you make a decision on how it should sort of be at the end so, so that's also relevant issues to take into consideration thank you thanks very much I, you know I think this is quite a it's quite a, um, a, a rich discussion and and and, uh, and I think there's been a lot of harmony and I think seriousness uh, about this actually. I think we've had previous workshops on this topic that have just that have been much more contentious and that's interesting I, I think to reflect that we've come from a space of fairly conflictual tense debate to one where we are dealing with it in a more detailed and nuanced level. Um, I think um, I'm going to let the, the, the panelists freedom and what they want to focus on in their closing statements. I think issues that stand out for me is the question about can the process work? Can a multi-process, a multi-stakeholder decision-making process work if government withdraws? And I think that's a really real question for me uh, as someone from civil society who tried to tries very hard to work with government and government is usually the stakeholder that it's the most difficult to bring to the table and keep at the table throughout the process and, and so that's, I think that's an important question. I think the question, it, it's the point that Wolfgang made about walking the talk, about building the process as we, um, as we do it. I'd like the panelists to reflect on that as well, but from the perspective of, of John's inputs as well, that this is a process, and Brinales as well, that it has to start with agenda setting, but it also has to include some kind of accountability and, and report card uh, or, or accounting for whether inputs have been um, taken into account. At the African IGF, we recently made recommendations that if inputs are not taken into account, there should be accounting for that and explanation of why those inputs were not taken into account. So that was the point that was made. So how do we walk this talk and do this process, but in a way that, that self-improves and that actually involves assessment and learning that goes back into it? And I think maybe the other question which we should not ignore is that we are sitting in the IGF in the IGF, we are never quite sure for how many years we will still be sitting in the IGF. Um, and there are also other processes. There's the CSDD process on enhanced cooperation. There's the World Summit on the Information Society, uh, plus 10, which includes some assessment on where the Tunis agenda um, decisions around internet governance have been implemented. There's the Brazil meeting, which is coming in in a very pivotal way, catalytic way to deal with specific issues. Um, so if you can perhaps re reflect on how we deepen this process, get beyond the general, um, 
looking at some of these specific questions and then some of these processes and the roles that you see them playing. I think uh, part of deepening and making progress is what has been expressed as we're building the process as we do it and we're sharing experiences. I, I think, you know, I, I would be able to have a couple of other examples of things we're doing in the, in the U.S. that are multi-stakeholder. They're not all of them comprehensive with all of the elements, which I think is another takeaway here, that there will be some variability depending on what the issue is, what the context is. But what's important, again, looking at these kind of internet-related issues, is to try to move as far as possible in these different settings to observing all of the principles here, that, if that makes some sense. You know, to try to kind of push the envelope, as you say, as one says, to be as comprehensive as possible. One of the issues we have not discussed a lot, but that I do think is really important, are uh, what does consensus look like? How does consensus happen? And again, there, I think, will benefit over time from sharing of experiences and examples as to how that can work because I do think it is really important. The other uh, final point I want to mention is on this question of um, articulating how input from the, the multi-stakeholder process was integrated. There, in a way, there's a, a learning, I think, from our traditional way in the, in the U.S. and I assume in other places. When we have our regulator make a decision in certain types of proceedings, not that the regulator works on internet issues, but nonetheless, under our administrative procedure law, there is an obligation to make a decision based on the record. Of course, it's a decision in the public interest, but it has to be based on what's in the record and therefore an explanation of how that was or was not taken into account. So again, maybe there learnings we can take from different places to try to come as close as possible to the over time. Well, I have three comments. Uh, first, on the question of transparency of inputs, I think it's a very relevant point, and I have a concrete example to give to you that in Brazil, the uh, draft bill that is now being analyzed by our National Congress on the civil framework on, for the internet as we call it. it actually is the result of a very transparent public consultation by the government prior to sending it to Congress. And it has been done using the internet, through the internet. It was the first time that this was done, and uh, uh, we were very proud to note that there was a huge interest on behalf of our society uh, to contribute to it. All comments on each specific article in some article are there uh, to anyone to see and then uh, including to follow up on to which extent they were taken up or not. In the end, the draft bill that was presented by the government uh, was uh, inspired uh, basically by the 10 uh, principles that were developed in a multi-stakeholder environment, which is our internet government steering committee. The second comment is that related to what if government decides to withdraw? That's a very good question. I have in my mind the idea that there, there is no government without the consent of the governed, which means that uh, governments require, require legitimacy. Uh, it is not up to a, a bureaucrat somewhere just to decide, okay, now I'm not attending this meeting anymore because it doesn't interest my government. It is not. Uh, my government in the sense that I work for the government and I am a, uh, therefore speaking on behalf of it, it's actually, I would say, my government because I am a citizen of a country that empowers its government to act on my behalf. So that's how I see it. So when it comes to withdrawing, I don't think it's possible by this, for the same reason that it is not possible for any country today to withdraw support for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights became a norm, an international norm, as it was said. And it, it is not up to a decision of a country, okay, now I will withdraw this declaration because it doesn't interest my uh, uh, specific objectives, policy objectives for the next term or so. Right? So uh, that's uh, my... <laughs>
but what if the government is simply disregarding it? Well, then we have a question on uh, accountability, responsibility, and implementation. It then is taken to a next uh, level of debate. It is not that the and there is the possibility of just withdrawing. And uh, by saying, okay, I will withdraw from the set of principles, uh, it doesn't mean that the government will be able to uh, go against them and just act in disregard. Of them. This is the possibility that I cannot visualize because of what I said. And the third and last comment is related to uh, contextualizing. One of the uh, great uh, uh, words that came up during the debate, I think my colleague from Malaysia for uh, presenting this work, because we need to bear in mind that there are no solutions that would fit all the questions that we have. Uh, we need to con contextualize not only in terms of geography, but also in terms of substance of issues. Which issues will be taken up in which? Uh, forum or which approach or which environment. And what we do need to have, perhaps, is a way that will encompass all these different frameworks, all these different contexts, a uh, chapeau, a kind of framework for various approaches that would be a reference at the international level and the global level to say and to legitimize each one of these individual processes regarding geography and issue-oriented uh, approaches. That's why uh, we are very keen on uh, what Ambassador Benedicto said about having a, an international civil framework. That's the idea behind it, a reference that will not rewrite what we have, but will uh, be used as a reference in which all the process will be recognized and will be checked against our shared principles and values that will be discussed both in terms of non-stakeholder principles as well as substantively internet governance principles. Thank you. Well, after that intervention, I don't really have much to add, to be quite honest. Um, I think you actually said many things that I wanted to say. Just to emphasize uh, the question of legitimacy, I think uh, government um, Particularly at this point in time, we need to we need to keep other stakeholders very close in all decisions that we make. Uh, this is this is increasingly important, I think. Uh, not least the civil society, having in mind what uh, has transpired uh, in, in the last six months or so. Um, I think one uh, one practical example of, of, of that was was the reaction my government to the 13 principles on surveillance that civil society developed over the last half year. Um, we, have took, we have taken the time to analyze them and come up with a response, um, which my minister delivered at the conference in Seoul last week. And we believe it's important to continue the discussions on these issues. We are happy to use the framework which the civil society has developed. Let's continue the discussion on these extremely important for government to continue to talk to other stakeholders. It includes civil society, but also others. Uh, and this has to do with legitimacy, trust, and also the issue of transparency, which I think is key. And I, I agree with those who, who, who say that the government should also um, explain why they do not accept certain proposals. That will also increase transparency and, and trust. And I'm happy to give the floor to Anne Rochelle Ine from Afrinik, who unfortunately was late. Go for it. And I apologize tremendously for being late. And um, um, I'm going to launch right into it and say that, um, uh, as John said, one of the things that uh, we've done in the technical community uh, and uh, at Afrinik in particular is uh, definitely in engage the regional community. Uh, as a regional internet registry, we are not only a technical community, but from the beginning we have taken very seriously our development process, which meant that we were technical people speaking geek 
maybe, but having the, the duty to actually make sure that from civil society to private sector to government in our region that everybody was involved, uh, you know, from the beginning in what we were doing. So in terms of the multi-stakeholder, I can't say that from the beginning uh, uh, that our community was completely multi-stakeholder, but we've made sure that along the way we've come to the point, for example, that today, you know, um, some of the people from the, uh, the region are here to, to testify that uh, uh, the technical community has been out of its way in the African region to make sure that, you know, nationally, regionally, today the Regional Economic Commission, the African Union, Afrinik is, is an observer, for example, at the African Union Commission, participates in the ministerial meetings. Um, it's it's like the sounding board on, on things technical. Um, so slowly, we can't say that we were cohesive and in integrating everybody, you know, directly in the policies that were developed at the beginning of the uh, uh, of Afrinik, for example. But today, uh, we have governments that are members. We have private sectors that are members. We have civil society that are members. And policies are really vibrantly discussed on this, and uh, issues are put forward, taking into account um, everybody's perspective. Now we do work by consensus, and uh, this is one of the things that I think uh, quite a few people alluded to. What is consensus? Um, consensus where we stand is where uh, the majority in the policy development process agrees that something should go forward. So everybody has a say, but not every say counts to the end. Um, and at one point, yes, uh, one of the issues that we have with, you know, multi-stakeholder processes is that somebody somewhere at one moment has to make the decision. So uh, policy development process has people from the community that are representatives of the community that uh, everybody agrees can make this final decision after they have listened to everybody. So it's transparent, it's open, it's inclusive in so much that it's open that everybody can participate. But uh, I have to be honest and say, for example, that today we still, I, I can't purpose and say that we're, we're speaking for the majority of the African community, for example because not everybody is connected, not everybody can participate remotely, though we do have the mechanisms for it. Not everybody comes to the meetings where these policies are debated, uh, but these are things that touch everybody today in terms of you know, the, the infrastructure, the architecture of the internet. So it is important that everybody participates, and it's, uh, it's, it's progress. Some of the principles that we're putting here are very important that uh, uh, for, I guess, the, the future mechanisms that are coming. And I'm glad to say that, uh, you know, in the technical community, we've gone quite, we've come a long way, and uh, we have really uh, uh, included quite a lot of people in the discussion process as well. Thank you. Okay. And Wolfgang, thanks, Anne. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to make a brief comment to one of the questions raised by. Uh, remote participant when he asks you the questions, do we need a multi-stakeholder council? I think it's a good question because, you know, if you have some principles and procedures in place, at the end of the day, you have to have also a mechanism and, you know, how to deal with this in a way. You know, I was in the Dubai Wicked Conference and we had this long discussions about Article 5A and 5B about spam and security. And there was an agreement in the room, at least among a lot of countries, that uh, the ITU should not deal with content of information, spam-related and security issues. There should be other places to discuss this. But the question is where? So that means you cannot say to governments, you should not do this in the ITU, and then they ask oh, where, where I can discuss this. That means we have to have a place where we can discuss these issues. And while there was a common understanding, at least among a lot of governments in Dubai, that, you know, 
there should not be go back to another intergovernmental organization. Then the question is where? I think ICANN has only a very limited mandate. It's a technical organization. ICANN should not deal with security and content-related issues. But it means and immediately you discover here's a gap in the mechanisms, in the multi-stakeholder ecosystem. And I think this has to be, um, you know, further investigated that we need something like what I, I would call it a multi-stakeholder internet policy organization it could be a MIPO and um, acronym uh, for the multi-stakeholder internet policy organization this organization should not make decisions but this multi-stakeholder body where all stakeholders are represented in a way with five or seven representatives could give advice because the, the, the uh, terminology advice or the legal status of an advice is a very interesting one. It gives a lot of flexibility. That means the multi-stakeholder body could give advice, for instance, to governments and to say, here you have to do something. You have a decision-making capacity. This is a question with, under your responsibility, and you have to make now a decision based on consultation with other stakeholders. Or they can give advice to the technical community and say, here we need a new protocol. Could you do this? So because it's not that we have to create a new decision-making body which is on top of all this internet governance ecosystem. It's a network among equals, but we have to have in the center something like a clearinghouse. And such a multi-stakeholder body or a MIPO could function like a clearinghouse which could give advice to one stakeholder or a group of stakeholders on a case-by-case -case basis. I think this could be a step forward into this uncharted territory. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, I, you know, I think we almost uh, have just opened a whole new line of discussion, which is the multi-stakeholder body and the civil framework. Do we need both or one or the other? Where does the IGF fit in? I, I think very broadly, I just want to get the feel of the room on something. Do you feel that we've reached the point with, with, with multi-stakeholder participation and IG um, that people sometimes reach in relationships or marriages or life partnerships where there's enough security and confidence in that relationship that you can really start complaining about all the things that you're unhappy about and, and working out how to improve the relationship? Or do you think we're still at a phase where we have some fear that, that, that there'll be um, that the discrepancies in power and influence and the commitment to working together is not as solid as it should be. So, Everton, are you ready to repeat your marriage vows? To Thank you. I'm not married, actually, <laughs> but anyway. You are to multi-stakeholder processes. In, uh, I, I prefer to leave that question uh, in the open. I don't think we need to reply directly to that now. I, I think we should observe the development that we will have in the next few months and see how our internet governance community will react to some very specific demands to see how our relationship is really evolving. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, everyone, and thanks to the remote participant and the remote moderator, to the people who prepared this session, to everyone in the panel and everyone in the room. And the conversation will continue. Thanks. <laughs>